where we left off this morning. So let's go back to James chapter 1. <clears throat> we'll read the set of scriptures again. Beginning from verse number 22. <clears throat> For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Who can tell us what the title of the morning message was? God's work. God's work. God has work. And he needs laborers. So we kind of went through a time of examining ourselves as a congregation and hopefully um, a fellowship and individually and um, discussed what God is looking for in this great work, <clears throat> what it requires. Had a number of questions as to why certain things are not different from how they are. Questions to provoke my thinking. Don't answer out loud, but I'm going to ask the question again. <clears throat> Do you think that God's work is advancing in the church? And so you say that since why you mean the Universal church. Yes. Okay. But we, we need to make it personal as well. <laughs> we need to make it personal as well because as we are individually, so we will be collectively. Right. Okay. So, um, in other words, are people getting saved? Are men, women, and children being made holy? Mm -hmm. That's what the, God's work is. Yeah, and, and at the end of it all, his work is nothing short of holiness of heart and life and the children of fallen Adam. <laughs> And that includes you and me and everybody else that's ever lived and come to the age of accountability. So, um, are we have, do we have the hunger and the thirst that we ought to have? Can we say that we live before God without rebuke in this crooked and perverse nation? My Lord. Mm. Are all of our preachers really holy? Mm. We certainly hope so, don't we? Yes, yes. Amen. However, sad to say, it hasn't always been so. But you know what? God knows how to expose things. And he will sooner or later if his ministry don't do it themselves. The ministry are slow to do it or maybe don't want to do it, don't want to touch it, even though they know it needs to be touched. God will upset the whole apple cart, won't he? Yeah. And you've seen him do it. <laughs> My Lord. And so the concern that I have personally is... Why are we not seeing more healings? Why are we not seeing a, a greater outpouring of the Spirit, even in our services? Why do we drag to pray? Why do we drag to testify? We always have something we can give God thanks for. Always. And iron sharpens iron, and if we all come to church and look at one another, if nobody has anything to share, nobody's going to get sharpened. He's going to put us all to sleep. So, um... The, the question we had this morning, why do we have so few outpourings of the Holy Spirit in our congregations and in our services? Well, the answer to that, which we're going to get into here, is that we have cultivated other things to the neglect of holiness. My Lord. So just by way of reminder, this title tonight will be God's Work Needs, and you fill in the blank. God's Work Needs. What does God's work need? 
If I were to put that question on the floor now, what would be your response? And we'll see how we come out with this. Anybody dare open your mouth and say what you're thinking? What does God work, God's work need? We want to, do we want to see more? Are we content? Are we content with what we see? Are we satisfied that God's work is flourishing and abounding? And if you if that's what you think, I would have to say you're spiritually blind. Because it's not what we see. So you might be slow to answer it because you don't want to say the wrong thing, but let's be honest. Let's, let's face this thing head on. Um, I don't believe we're seeing what we would like to see, but there's a reason when we don't. What makes us different from all the other churches around town other than the fact we dress different? What are we doing more than they're doing? In some cases, they're doing more if you want to look at numbers. They're gathering the talent and they're they're zealous. They're gaining new members. What? Why aren't we? How long has it been since we got a, a new convert that really stuck? Unfortunately, the last ones we had don't live here. Thank God we have them. Thank the Lord. We claim them. Amen. But I'd like to see some sitting in our pews every Sunday and every Wednesday. Amen. Amen. So we want to be a doer of the word. That means action. There's, there are there's action that needs to be accomplished and a doer of the work. All of this, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, connects to our obedience. Our lifestyle has something to do with our work. Uh, telling the good news and building the kingdom. That's what it means to be a doer of the work and a doer of the word. And this morning we asked the question, why are revivals so few and results so temporary? We hear it from time to time, not, not here, uh, so far as our congregation, but among the ministry, it's discussed from time to time. You know, we hear about these big, booming revivals and souls are coming and getting saved, but in most cases, it's temporary. It doesn't last. Oh, Lord. So, why is it that the results are so temporary? Why are there so few that really, you know... And somebody comes and gets saved, we almost hold our breath wondering how long they're going to last. Will we even see them next week? We've seen it happen over and over again. Well, what can we do to change that? Can we do anything? Well, we don't have control over people's minds and desires. You know, we can't change them. We can't make them. No, we can't. But there's something we need to be doing that we're not doing enough of. And I asked the question this morning, why can't? Pastors hold their own revival meetings. Why is it that they always look for somebody from the outside as though they can't have the influence? I think I remember way back in the day um, when Possum Road was still in fellowship, they would have three-week meetings at a time, and I think Brother Bill Wilson was the evangelist at times. And he was the pastor. He had his own revival. And from what I understand, they had results. We don't see that anymore, do we? We hardly see any preachers at all because they're in short supply. So why don't we see great outpourings or large outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the church and in our community? Um, where's the passion for the things of God? All right, well, let's proceed here. And we're going to try to emphasize what I believe is the greatest need. We have actually cultivated other things to the neglect of the work of holiness. We've gotten, I feel like in some ways, we've gotten distracted. Our minds are preoccupied with material things, making a living and buying stuff, even stuff for the church. We're so concerned about ascetics. Nothing wrong with ascetics, but if that overshadows and that's our passion and not winning souls, we miss the mark. We have missed the mark. Um, we have state-of-the-art technology. We've got a wonderful sound system, and we've got an online streaming, and all of that's well and good. But what's it doing for the kingdom? What's it being accomplished as a result of it? Um, we're living in a very materialistic world. Money, that almighty dollar people are scrambling for, trying to make money, and trying to put food on their table, in most cases, we have more than we need. 
And people are, have so much money jingling in their pockets, they eat out almost every day. Or at least once or twice, maybe three times a week, eat out. That means more money than if you stay home and cook. I don't feel like cooking. I'm only one person. And uh, it costs more to cook than it does to eat out. Well, I would object to that. I don't believe that. Depends on whether or not you're willing to eat leftovers. No, I can stay home and cook much less expensively than I can eat out every day, especially now that the cost of living has gone up. And as some were discussing earlier this afternoon, you can't hardly get even a fast food meal for less than $10. I can cook a good meal for less than $10. You might not like it, but it'll be healthy for me. <laughs> My Lord. People are busy shopping. They're going shopping for clothes. They're going shopping for fun. They go, some people go to shop just for the sake of shopping. And I guess it's considered a stress reliever. Spending time out window shopping and looking at cars and in many cases going into debt. But there seems to be a lack of real passion for the work of God. It has been said some few years ago I heard a statistic with regard to the Muslims compared to Christianity. Now the Muslims are very passionate about what they believe. So much so that if a family member defects, they will disown them. If a father and a mother have a child uh, who, let, let's say, would come to the United States and become a Christian, they would not, they would be, in some cases, they'd be afraid to even go back to their home country because their family would disown them. And in some cases, they have the obligation to actually kill them. Now that's a passion for what they believe. And it has been said that they, in the promotion of what they believe, and they are growing, by the way, around the world. I don't believe all that growth is because of willing service. I think a lot of it's based on fear. But nonetheless, it has been said that Muslims give 17% of their income to their cause. And Christians, we'll put that in quote, give 2%. What does that say about passion? For the kingdom of God. They will give that much of their money to something that we know is false. Islam, or rather Allah, if Allah were real, Allah is so far removed from them, he would never enter into our world. Thank God for Jesus. Jesus entered in and became like us, therefore he can have compassion on us, he can yes. identify with us, and he cares and he answers our prayer. Allah is so far removed and so so supposed holy and whatever, they can't even touch him. And they're going busy praying five times a day toward Mecca, trying to get his attention, and yet he doesn't answer in many cases. But that's the passion that they have for what they believe. In many cases, we have substituted the external, the things that satisfy the flesh, for the internal, the things that minister to the soul. And the real cause of that can be traced back even further. Take this for what it's worth, but I'm persuaded that this is largely due to the decay of prayer. The decay of prayer. Our prayers have become routine. We get up in the morning and hopefully we pray before we go to school or go to work or start our day. But what does that prayer consist of? Is it a repetition of what I prayed for yesterday or the prayer that I articulated yesterday? We can almost predict in some cases how that prayer would go. We address it by dear Lord or dear God or Heavenly Father, however you start that prayer. We give a couple of sentences of thanksgiving and go straight into our petitions. And it becomes formulaic, becomes a formula. And so, with the decline of the work of holiness has come also the decline of the business of prayer. Many times we might offer a prayer or two for something, but when God doesn't come through in our time, we find another solution. We, we can answer our own prayer. There's a too much work. I've been praying for a week or two and nothing's happening. I think I can figure out what to do myself and I'll just stop praying. 
You might be surprised how many times that happens in the lives of so-called Church of God folk. The business of praying. The Bible says pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that you're on your knees 24-7. It means that you never stop praying in that you have a consistent, continual prayer life. Also, the scripture writer said men ought always to pray. What? Without ceasing. Hmm. Without? What? Ceasing. What does that mean to cease, Sister Donna? Stop. Pray without stopping. Well, I'm discouraged, and God's not answering my prayers. So we quit? No, God is looking for us to be passionate. Many times he withholds his blessing because we don't want it bad enough. And then Jesus told the disciples when they could not cast out the demon, what did he say? This kind cometh not forth but by prayer, and fasting coupled with it. When was the last time you had a good fast day? Do we have to announce it in church before you'll do it? Many things we learn to explain away. Now I'm speaking in generalities here. You take what is yours and thank God if there's something that isn't yours. So it just seems like the emphasis on God's work today isn't really put so much on prayer itself. Somehow we see prayer as an accessory but not a necessity, generally speaking. Why? Because we have resources. We want somebody to come and hold a meeting, which we'll is called Brother Campbell, or we'll call Sister Susan Q, or we'll call Brother Jones, or we'll call whomever. And if we hear that some overseas brother's in town, we'll call him over for a service or two. But that's not really revival. That's a, a refreshing, we trust, of sorts, but that's not going to grow the work of the Lord. And so we get busy, but are, is our busyness really effective? Is it really effective? Every Sunday you assume the pastor will be at her post, right? Right, true. How much did you pray for her during the week? No, did you do more than just call her name? All the time. Did you, are you making too many assumptions? Because I'm telling you right now, if I went on my feelings, I'd be at home about now. But I have a, I have a duty to perform at my, I'm at my post. And I don't do that grudgingly, and I don't do that um, to kind of boast or anything of that sort. It's a passion. God put me here, and I want to fulfill my obligation. I want to do it well. I, got it. I don't want to just throw something together and, and, and hand it to you. You can tell, generally, when a preacher is prepared and when he or she is not. Mm -hmm. And when they're not, you don't get a good meal. It's just kind of a hodgepodge and just kind of off the cuff. I don't do well with those kind of messages. Uh, I am methodic, and I believe in studying and preparing and trying to get my thoughts collected and so forth. There have been a few times when I didn't have the opportunity to do so and had to scramble and get something. Well, God will have mercy, and he'll help us in times like that. But if we take that for granted and assume that, oh, it don't matter, I'm just preaching to the home saints, well, that's not a good attitude to have, is it? Right. Just the home saints? These are souls that are headed to eternity. Right. And we need to do our best, whatever our situation is. So, <clears throat> we don't want to assume too many things, saints. We need truly to pray. And praying and holiness go together. They go together. There's a book I have. I think I brought it up here. Maybe I didn't. Is that book on, the, on, the, on my pew, E.M. Bounds? Okay, just hold it up so the saints can see it. I don't have to have it. Okay, this is a book that I would recommend all of you read thoroughly and be challenged by. It's the complete works of E.M. Bounds on prayer. Look how thick that book is. And if you were to look at the print, it's not large print. That man covers every facet of prayer. And it is he that has said this. Prayer and holiness go together. Decline of one 
means the decay of the other. So what does that mean? The decline of praying leads to the decay of holiness. So if we're going to be holy, we're only going to be holy to the degree that we pray. And we're going to have to pray and pray hard. We've got to be willing and determined and passionate to pray alone, to get alone, have spent quality time alone with God. Quality time. Now, some of us live alone, so there's not a problem to be alone to pray, but are we spending quality time in that aloneness? Now, I'm not saying lonely, I'm saying alone, without distraction. There are many times I'm thankful that I'm alone. I'm grateful that I'm by myself, that I don't have the distractions that others have. But in the midst of you being a father and a, and a husband and a worker, Brother Blade, you've got to find time to be alone with God. You're not going to be able, and this is not a reflection. I'm not criticizing him. I'm just simply letting him know, like I tell myself, you've got to find time to study. You've got to find time to meditate. Yes, you have to take care of your duties as a husband, as a father, as an employee, as, an, as a supervisor. And sometimes I wonder, how do you do it with the long hours you, you work? But you have to make time for God and for prayer. Those of you who are in school, same thing. Before you go to school, you need quality time before the Lord in prayer so you can be a light at school. When you come home, before you go to bed, pray. Seek the Lord. Don't take that prayer for granted. And as long as you've been around the church of God and in the church of God and saved now, your prayer should be more than baby prayers. You should be getting before God with some earnestness. Especially you, Cornell. Don't mean to pick on you. You're getting ready to head off to college in a little bit. You need guidance and direction from above. My God, help me. Help and we pray for you, but you're going to have to get your answers for yourself. Lord. Ultimately. And with our prayers and yours together, God will lead you if you be led. Amen. My so God. all of this is so important. Yes. My God. We need solitude. Some people just hate to be by themselves. Well, you know what? When you pray, you're not really by yourself if you're connecting. Mm -hmm. You have to shut out the world. Whether we need those times of solitude, getting away from distractions. Shut the phone off. Hmm. Now that's a challenge. These cell phones that are pinging all the time. That's why it's good to get up early in the morning before people are up and around and they start texting you. That's when in your quiet time can be. True. Now, pastors generally, fortunately, I'm not necessarily in that category. But a lot of pastors are getting calls all hours of the day and night from people that don't have pastors in many cases. And people are seeking counsel and all this. They, too, have to be able to find a place and a time to be alone with God and shut out all of that stuff. My Lord. Let the answering machine get it. Unless it's an emergency, somebody needs instant prayer, put that to the side and do what you must in order to keep your connection with God. This is God's work. This is what, if we want God's work to work, it's not going to happen if we don't have consistent quality time alone with God. This is so necessary. Now I'm going to share with you, and, I, and get you young folk, get your Bibles ready, because I'm going to ask you to help me. I'm going to give you six reasons why Jesus chose solitude over people. Solitude over people. We're going to use our greatest example, Jesus Christ himself. All right? So I'm going to call out a few scriptures. I'll call them three at a time. So Ariana, we need Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and verses 14, 15. Cornell, if you would get Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, and 10 through 12. And then I'll ask you after that to drop down further into the chapter. All right. And um, Carlton, Matthew 14. Now, this one's going to be a little lengthy, but you can do it. Verses 1 through 13, so we can get the back story. All right. Six reasons that Jesus chose solitude over people. Now, everybody get your Bibles and follow along. The first scripture is going to be in Luke chapter 4. So don't just sit there and listen, follow in your Bible. 
and even be good to take notes because you're going to need it one day sooner or later. Luke chapter 4, read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to drop down. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Okay, so he's in the wilderness. He's been fasting for forty days. What do you think he was doing while he was fasting? Praying. Praying. Fasting and prayer go together. So for forty days, he's interceding and he's praying to his father and we would ask ourselves why did he have to pray he was the son of god well he was also the son of man and he was our example so he was looking to god as a man because satan was coming to overthrow him to tempt him etc etc and he needed god to help him so if you knew satan was coming after you for a space of time mm -hmm. don't you think you'd need to pray don't you think you'd need to importune and and probably turn your plate down if you knew you were going to go through a severe temptation well God Jesus went through that for the purpose of being able to help us you can never say God doesn't understand Jesus doesn't understand he never felt what I feel oh yes he has he's felt all of you what you have felt and more and this is an example of when he was doing that. All right, so after this is all over, now let's drop down and read verses 14 and 15. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues and glorified the all. Okay, now, he's gone through this great temptation, he has been fasting and praying, and he was able to go through it successfully. And the reason that he was there in those first verses, by himself, he was preparing. Why was he fasting and praying so much? He hasn't even started in his public ministry yet. Right. He was preparing himself for a major task. Hmm. Here the devil came in and bombarded him and tried to do everything he could to overthrow him. But obviously he conquered him, and after it was all over with, then he returned in the spirit of God, uh, in the power of the spirit in the Galilee, and there went out of fame, and he taught in the synagogue. He could not have done that effectively if he had not first spent time alone with God and conquering the devil. He came out of there with great power. Make sense? Yes. <laughs> all right, so he's preparing for a major task. What major task might you end up having to prepare for, and how would you do so? If God had something special for you to do, how would you prepare for it? You need to go along with God somewhere, some way, somehow, and get some power and get some guidance and some direction for whatever this major task might be. All right, number two. Luke chapter 9. Verses 1 through 6. Now, the, the, the reason that Jesus is alone here, now, these are, every scripture I have has to do with Christ in solitude, going before God. All right? Now, let's see here. Nine. All right. So, the reason that he is alone here is that he needs to get recharged after some hard work. You know, you know that can happen. You know, I was thinking about, and I didn't take the time to try to find it before I came, but there's a book that um, E. Byram wrote about his travels in other places. And he was down in the Caribbean somewhere, I can't remember where, some islands down there. And remember, he's a man that had the gift of healing, or gifts of healing, perhaps. And people got word of that, and they started coming by the droves. And he was praying for the sick, praying for the sick, and finally at the end of the day, he had to go to his room. And when he went to his room, wherever it was, I think it was up on an upper level somewhere, he looked out the window and people were still 
gathering down there because they wanted prayer. Now, this is not Jesus I'm talking about. It's not Peter and John. This is a man that lived 120 years ago or whatever. And the man was exhausted. And when you get exhausted, even in the work of the Lord, you can get tired. And you need to get recharged. And so this is what's happening in this particular instance. So let's read the first six verses, and then we'll drop down. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Then he called his twelve disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all devils, and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God, and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of the city, shake off the dust, bear, shake off the very dust from your feet, for a testimony against them. Mm -hmm. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Okay, now let's pause for a moment. Get the picture in your mind. Jesus has empowered the disciples to go out, heal the sick, cast out devils, cure diseases, preach the kingdom. So they're preaching all of the things that they have learned from Jesus. They don't have a Bible like we do. But the Jesus taught them. I mean, he was hands-on teacher. And he has taught them, and now he's sending them out to spread the gospel and to heal the sick and cure diseases. And he's giving them instructions such that's going to try their faith. Verse 3 says, take nothing for your journey. Now, I'm persuaded that Jesus, usually he sent them out two by two, which is a good idea. That way, while one is talking, the other could be praying, or they work together, whatever. And so uh, he said, this two, this direction, and south and west and north and southeast and northeast and northwest, whatever. He sent them to different locations. And he's telling them, don't take anything for your journey. Neither stays, script, bread, money, don't even have two coats apiece. In other words, you're going to trust me for your sustenance. You're going, to, you're going to eat whatever the people of the town give you to eat. Those who invite you in, that's where you're going to stay. Whatever they feed you, they're going to give you. Uh, that's where you're to eat. And their faith was being tried to the limit. They'd never done this before. But they did go. Verse 6 says, they departed, and he already told them, whoever won't receive you, uh, shake off the dust of your feet and, as a testimony and keep moving. Don't, get, don't start pouting and come back and say, well, they wouldn't listen to me. Just move on to the next location. They departed. They went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, that takes something out of you. Physically and emotionally, that is draining. All right, now we drop down to verses 10 through 12, and let's see what happens. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. He took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethesda. Bethesda. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that they need that they had need of healing. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, so in verse number 10, it says, when they were returned, they told Jesus all of what had happened. I'm sure they had lots of stories to tell. They were probably excited. They had never done this before, and God was with them and blessed them. And the Bible says, Jesus took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Why do you think he did that? Why do you think Jesus took them aside into a desert place? Nobody knows? So they get They're tired. To let them be They're quiet. exhausted. Yeah, what'd you say? To let them be quiet for a while. Oh, be quiet and rest. The body can only take so much. Right, right. The body can only take so much. They needed to get recharged. They needed to get refurbished or whatever word you want to use. And uh, even then, when people heard about him, here they come again. And that's kind of like E.E. E. Byron, the example I gave you. He, pray, he prayed for thousands, as it were, and then when he goes up to his room, there's more waiting. I mean, 
at some point he had to, he had to collapse if he didn't get some rest. So this is reasons for solitude. We get tired, saints, even in the work of the Lord. We don't want to kill ourselves in the work of God. And if those of you, as I mentioned this morning, those of you who are taking care of your loved ones, you've got to get rejuvenated at times. You've got to get some help or got to relax or some kind of way. Otherwise, you can get sicker than the sick. I mean, our bodies can only take so much. So here they needed to get recharged. All right, now, the next one is quiet time solitude to work through grief. Okay, Cornell, Matthew chapter 14, and let's read the first 13 verses. At that time, Herod the uh, uh, Partridge heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore my works do shew forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison of Herodias, say, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have it. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, danced before them, and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she asked would ask. And she, being, being before and instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John, ba John Baptist had in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless of the oath's sake, and then which sat with him at me. He commanded it to be given to her. And he sent, and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger, and given to the uh, damsel. The damsel. And she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came, and took up the body, and buried it, and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the city. It would seem that Jesus hardly ever had time to be alone. <laughs> as soon as the people found out where he was, they started after him. But when he heard, the Bible says when he heard it, heard what? Heard about John. John Baptist was his cousin, by the way. And when he heard that, he was grieved. He was hurt. And he departed by ship into a desert place apart. It would seem that he didn't even have his disciples with him. He's just going to some place of solitude to grieve and to meditate. John the Baptist was dead, and it was it was all unfair. Uh, but John Baptist was not a coward, and he boldly told Herod it wasn't legal for him to have his brother Philip's wife. She doesn't belong to you. She belongs to another man, and that made Herodias angry. So she was out for John's head and find it, found a way through trickery to get what she wanted. All right, now. The next one, number four, we're back around to uh, Ari. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Now this one has perhaps more relevance or as much relevance to us as any of the others, and that is we need solitude, we need to pray before making an important decision. Important decisions, what would that be in our day? It might be uh, considering somebody to marry. That's very important. That is life changing. You definitely need some solitude. Don't do what everybody tells you. You need to hear from God for yourself. Uh, of, of a large purchase, maybe the buying of a home or the buying of a car or some other decision. You know, I've got some health issues and I've got to decide what I'm going to do. How am I going to handle this? How am I going to deal with this? So whatever that important decision is, we need not to listen to everybody's voice and everybody's uh, uh, counsel, but listen for God. Get along with the Lord. Turn your plate down and pray. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we are. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. 
and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called, upon, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named the apostles. Okay, now that was a huge decision for Jesus. He had lots of followers, and if you remember, also in Luke, I uh, remember the chapter, maybe the 17th or 18th chapter, he sent out 70 disciples, two by two. That's the 10th or 11th chapter. Oh, okay, I'm ahead. Okay, but anyway, it's here in Luke. And he called the 70 together, and he sent them out to do his work. So he had lots of disciples, but these 12 were the special ones that were going to stick with him wherever he went. So before he chose them, the Bible says that he went into a mountain, presumably alone, to pray, and he continued all night in prayer. This was really an important decision he had to make. So he was praying and praying hard all night long. So before making an important decision, we need to pray. We need to pray. Make sure we know what we're doing when we make that decision, whatever it is. Okay, number five. Luke chapter 22, verses 9 through um, 39. Chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. And the, the reason in this particular instance is Jesus went into solitude in times of distress. Times of distress. Luke 22, 39 to 44. And he came out and went as he was went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Mm -hmm. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and a sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Go ahead and read the next verse, please. And when he, and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. He found them sleeping. You know what, there are some burdens that only you are going to be able to bear. Others can pray, but it's a burden that you're going to have to bear for yourself. Mm -hmm. Those disciples could not pray for Jesus in this time. They didn't even comprehend really what, we, what was happening. No. They couldn't grasp it. But he was in great distress. And so here he is in the garden. He left them outside. He went a little further. When he came back, they were asleep, which lets us know they had no idea what was happening. No comprehension at all. So in those times of distress, there will be times of distress that we need to not talk it about and, and broadcast it and hope that somebody will have sympathy. Just go alone and pray and get your guidance and get your direction. In those times of distress, Lord, what am I going to do? I'm facing a trial. I'm facing a situation. It could be something on your job. It could be something as a, of a family matter. It could be something in your community, your neighborhood, some of your relatives. It, it could be who knows what. But there are times, in those times of distress, rather than talking to this one and getting everybody's opinion and then getting totally confused, go to God in prayer, in solitude, and pray it through. All right. The last one, number six. Jesus went alone so that he could focus on prayer. So he could focus on prayer. All right, Luke chapter 5 and verse 16. Uh, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee, and Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Okay, now you can imagine that he was being drained of his virtue. But before he got to this point, he went to pray. 
Okay, so in verse number 15, well, in the verses above that, he's healing. He healed a leper. And every time he healed, great fame went out. And uh, this one man, he told him, go show yourself to the priest. So that man was so happy, he probably broadcasted every step of the way. Look at me, I'm healed. And that man back there did it. And so here come the people to, uh, to, uh, to converge upon him. And so much the more, the Bible says, a fame went out ahead of him. Great multitudes came, and he healed their infirmities. And that called for him to go aside and focus on prayer. He needed to re refurbish himself. He needed to renew his virtue and replenish his virtue. So it says in verse 16, he withdrew himself into the wilderness. He went to a place where he could be alone. The wilderness suggests, um, what does it suggest? uncultivated areas of bramble bushes and places where he could hide. <coughs> Into the wilderness, a forsaken place where nobody lives except the animals. And he prayed. He didn't just go over somewhere to think. He went over there to pray. My God. And then when he came back and he started teaching again, and the Pharisees and the doctors were sitting there and all of that, the Bible says the power of the Lord was present to heal. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he had been in prayer. My God. He had been in prayer. Help us, Lord. So as we wind down on this particular lesson, um, casual, on-the-run, snippet prayers are going to be ineffective. Mm -hmm. right. It's going to take more than that, saints. We want God's work to grow. It starts with prayer. Mm -hmm. It's through prayer that we can get direction. My Lord. It's through prayer that we can get courage. It's through prayer that opportunities will come and that God will open doors for us. Okay, a couple more scriptures. James chapter 5, and then uh, the next one get 1 Kings 8. James chapter 5, we're about to wrap this up. God's work needs, fill it in, what is it? Prayer. Prayer. <laughs> God's work needs prayer. We found out this morning what God's work is, and we're seeing that it's not getting accomplished as well as we would like to see it. So God's work needs prayer. Genuine, fervent, consistent prayer. All right, James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. All right. Who is Elias? Elijah. Elijah. So you remember when he prayed that there wouldn't be rain on the earth until he prayed again, until he said so? Mm -hmm. And who did he anger when he did that? Ahab. Oh, King Ahab. Oh, King Ahab. He was upset with him. Right. He prayed, and the place dried up. He went to the brook to get fed. That dried up. He sent him to the widow, and she was almost down to nothing, and God kept him safe there until it was time to do what he had to do. So the Bible says Elijah was like us, a man of like passions. He had feelings like you have and like I feel, of like passions. He was a man, just like you are a man or you are a woman. He was a man of mankind. He was human. And the Bible says he prayed, and the rain stopped. And then he prayed again. Now let's go see where he prayed again. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 through 46. First Kings 18, verses 41 to the end of the chapter. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now it hasn't rained for three years and six months, okay? And so Elijah hasn't even prayed yet, but he knows that the answer is going to come. And so he says to Ahab, or sends a message to him, get you up. Eat, drink, there is a sound of abundance of rain. Was there a sound of rain yet? Mm -mm. Not literally. He said that by faith, didn't he? Right. Verse 42, keep reading. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the 
top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face, bet put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up, and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a small cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up to say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Mm. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab, Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Je Jezreel. Mm. How did he run so fast? <laughs> he all ran that chariot. Mm. That's interesting. Okay, so Elijah's telling them the rain is about to come now. It hasn't rained for three years, six months. I think we read that in uh, one of the epistles back there, maybe James. He just read it, James, yes. Oh, did he read it? Okay. And um, so now Ahab's gone up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to Mount Carmel to pray for what he knew was already going to come. Why did he need to pray? If he knew rain was coming, why was it necessary to pray? Well, for your example and mine, we can have confidence that our prayer is going to be answered, but you better pray. Don't take it for granted. Lord. All right? So he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knee. One of you young men, come up here and demonstrate what that well looks like. <laughs> I don't think I want to ask Brother Dave to do it. I, I, you know that she didn't ask the older brother to do it. <laughs> You know what it, yeah, do ready for everybody to see it. <laughs> okay, now that's Elijah down there. Why did he do that? Why was that necessary for him to put his head between his knees? Mm. A sign of humility. Well, it's definitely humility. He cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between the knees. Okay, let me ask another question. What was the sky looking like about now? It's dark. Oh, yeah. No, it was at this point it's still clear. Yeah, still clear. Okay, probably not a cloud in the sky. Right, right. So he needed to get his eyes off of what was going on and focus on God. Absolutely. Wow. That's a lesson for you and me. Get your eyes off of the circumstances. Get your eyes off of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Get your eyes off of your pain. Get your eyes off of whatever it looks like. My God. And pray. Yes. And faith believing. Mm. So he put his head down between his knees. Mm. And then he told his servant, go up now in verse 43, go up now and look toward the sea. Mm -hmm. Now why didn't he do it himself? He didn't want to do anything that would hinder his faith. That's, right. that's, that's me talking. The scripture don't say it, but that surely makes sense to me. I prayed and nothing changed. Maybe God's not going to answer my prayer. Oh, maybe it's not the will of God. Oh, how many times we abort our own prayers because we don't pray long enough, fervently enough, with sufficient faith. Amen. So he told his servant, go up and look toward the sea, and he went up, and we saw there's nothing. So what did he do? Now, Scripture don't say this, but I'm persuaded he kept his knees to the ground and kept on praying. My Lord. And kept on praying. Amen. Amen. He prayed another prayer. Go look, servant. He comes back, time number two, nothing. He prays again. All the time he's got his head down. Because if he were to look up and see that, he didn't want that to distract him. I'm praying and I don't see nothing. All right. He went up, he looked, there's nothing. He said, go again, and he told him that seven times. We would have given up on time number three, perhaps. Maybe four. Maybe we would have gone, but Lord, help us to hang in until. Mm -hmm. Until. Amen. And it came to pass, verse 44, at the seventh time My God. that the servant said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea. Just a little cloud. Well, we can't get rain out of a little cloud. Oh, my. But that was a token of God's answer. That's all he needed. 
With that little bitty cloud, whatever it looked like, some say it was the size of a man's hand. The Bible doesn't say that. It just says it looked like a man's hand, but it was little. A little cloud Amen. like a man's hand. Praise the Lord. Praise and that Lord. was sufficient for him to send a message to Ahab and say, get yourself up. The rain is coming. My God. You better get yourself up and get back to wherever you need to be. You're going to get caught in the flood. My Lord. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, the rains came. Mm -hmm. The heaven was black. In the meantime, after they saw the little cloud in verse 45, it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with cloud. God doesn't take long. God doesn't have to take a half an hour to bring all the clouds in. You saw a little cloud and, and no longer uh, got up and said, tell Ahab, prepare your sheriff's chariot, get down, that the rain stopped thee not. You're going to get caught in the river. You're going to get caught in something. You better get down out of here. And it came to pass just in that short space of time. The heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. My God. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Mm. And Elijah gathered up his robes and he went running too. <laughs> he went running too. My God. Thank you, Lord. Thank so, what is the lesson for us? Mm. What's the lesson for me? I'm getting something out of this for myself. Do not let appearances discourage you, don't let what it looks like or even what it feels like discourage you in your praying. So what is the take home for us tonight? We need to shore up our prayer life. We need to believe for what we're asking. The Bible says ask largely. How many souls would you like to see this year saved as, and added to this congregation and how much faith do you have that it will come to pass? Oh, we can boast big numbers, but can you believe for those big numbers? Can you really believe that that's going to happen? I'd rather pray God and pray down one or two and with fervency and see results and pray, oh, God can do anything. I'm going to pray for 50 and then you don't have the faith to believe he'll do it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be brought to shame. Now, if you can believe for that many, have at it. But you want to do some praying, <laughs> for real. So let us all examine our prayer life. Prayer is not in fancy words. Prayer is not in eloquent speeches. But it's in faith and in persistence. Some of the most simple prayers have brought the most profound, profound results. The most profound results. The Bible says Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. When he was taking his son Isaac up the mountain, he had already been told to offer him up as a burnt sacrifice. And he's headed up the mountain with his son. He's got the wood. He's got the fire. And his son looked at him and said, Father, we have the wood. We have the fire. But where's the sacrifice? Where's the, the I don't know if that's the word he used, but where's the animal for the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? Whatever. God will provide. And, God, and Abraham was so wise in what he said. And what he said, he didn't tell him, well, it's going to be you, son. He told me, I got to put you on that altar. Well, he would have been headed down the mountain then. He would have been running away, perhaps. Unless he had the same faith that his father had. But all his father said was, the Lord will provide. That's all he said. And that was good enough for the son. They headed up the mountain. But when that son started getting tied up and placed on that altar, I don't know what he was saying, but he had implicit trust evidently in his dad. And Abraham drew the knife with full intention of killing that son of his. With faith and full assurance that God would raise him from the dead if it had to be. Man, now that's faith that's beyond comprehension. It is. It is. Not just killing, burn him up too. Absolutely. There wouldn't be anything to raise but ashes. That's right. But God can do even that. And that's how much confidence he had in God. My Lord. Mm. But just before the knife came down, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Lord. And the next thing you know, you hear this ram bleeding over here with his horns caught in a bush. God did provide, didn't he? Yes. He provided in style, grand style. And they went happily down the mountain. 
and Sarah was none the wiser until they told her afterwards. If Abraham had told her ahead of time, he'd have had a hard time taking that son up the mountain. I'm persuaded. Because remember, it was Sarah that got him in trouble to begin with. Or, or what's the other son's name? Ish Ishmael. Ishmael would never have been born if it hadn't been for Sarah. And he gave in to his wife. But anyway, let us pray. Let us see God. Let us believe when we pray. Amen. Let us take time to pray. Yes. Take time to fast. Don't wait until a calamity comes before you turn your plate down. It's good exercise. There's plenty of things to fast about. If you're not healthy enough to fast the whole day, don't just decide, well, I can't fast. You can fast a meal or two. You do what you have a mind to do. So may God help us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Any other comments? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Help or even questions? Amen. Anybody with a testimony? It seems to me, though, even when Elijah had his servant go and check, and he went seven times, and he finally came back with a report of a small cloud, I'll say it that way, a little cloud, mm -hmm. that still could have been discouraging. That's not enough to... Takes more than that for a storm, huh? Yeah, but but, it, but Elijah saw that, that things were turning his way, were trending his way, and that's all he needed. He jumped on it. Okay, that's right. right. We're good now. That's <laughs> right. That's Amen. all he needed. He got a token of it. He got that, like a witness. He got the witness. And it didn't take long for the rest of it to follow. That's right. Amen. Next thing you know, the whole cloud was black. The whole sky was black with clouds. Lord, increase our faith. Amen. Help us. Amen. Help us to be able to believe God. My faith, Lord. Amen. Yes, have faith in God. Amen. Lord, let's not make God, let's not bring God down to our level. God is not a man. Lord, help us to know how to believe. Amen. Even when things don't look good. All right, all minds clear? Thank the Lord. Amen. Any announcements? Also, uh, next Sunday is the third Sunday.